Russian forces are suffering their biggest defeats of the Ukraine war, and with victories in the east and Kyiv secured against Russian attack, Ukraine is once more pushing for fast-tracked membership into the NATO alliance. It doesn't stand alone either, as currently Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Montenegro, and North Macedonia all back Ukraine's joining of the world's most powerful military and political alliance. But can Ukraine really join NATO? And what would happen if it does? Currently, Ukraine is still a significant way to go to join NATO. Under the Washington Treaty, any European country can join NATO as long as it expresses a desire to contribute to the security of the Euro-Atlantic area. However, it must also abide by certain military, political, and economic standards before it may join. The first of these prerequisites is the country must have a functioning democratic political system, which is based on a free market economy. This is a challenge for Ukraine as its elections have been rife with manipulation for years as it struggles to throw off the yoke of Russian interference. Corruption is also a significant problem in the country, both due to incompetence, its status as maintaining a democracy, and the fact that a lot of the older generation still sympathizes with Russia. Before Ukraine could join NATO, it would have to tackle the problem of corruption and show the West that it's capable of holding open and fair elections, something it has made significant but not perfect progress on in the last eight years since the ouster of the former president in 2014. NATO aspirants must also show fair treatments to both racial and religious minorities. Here, Ukraine has made significant progress, though at the start of the war there were alarming reports of black students and other minorities not being allowed to board evacuation trains and buses ahead of whites fleeing the conflict. To join NATO, Ukraine would have to show that it's enacted significant legal protections for minorities and worked to mend this type of behavior. A third standard Ukraine must meet is a commitment to the peaceful resolution of conflicts. Ukraine easily qualifies here, as it did not seek out conflict with Russia. In fact, President Zelensky continued to press for a diplomatic solution even after the war started and did not initiate mass mobilization until the invasion began. Next, a NATO aspirant must be willing and capable of making a military contribution to NATO operations. In the past, this might have been in doubt given Ukraine's former Soviet-style military, but Ukraine has shown that it has learned significantly from American instructors in the eight years since Russia annexed Crimea. Now, Ukraine fields the best army inside of Ukraine and is handily defeating the Russian forces despite their overwhelming number superiority. The question of Ukraine's military value to NATO is now without question. Lastly, those who want to join NATO must be committed to a civilian-led government, where the military is subservient to civilian leadership. This rules out any military dictatorships, but as Ukraine builds the foundation of a strong future democracy, it's well on its way to meeting this criteria. But what if NATO were to hold a vote and Ukraine was unanimously voted into the alliance, despite its current problems? What would happen? First, there's a serious concern that Ukraine's war would by necessity become NATO's war. Article 5 of the alliance is the guarantor of European security and states that an attack on one member is an attack on all. This is what has kept Russian aggression at bay since the end of the Cold War, when Vladimir Putin hungrily eyed the breakaway Baltic states, who used to be Soviet republics. While individually the Baltic states could not face the Russian army, attacking them would mean attacking the entirety of the NATO alliance, which Russia wouldn't be able to face. There is room to question whether the ongoing war is a real concern for triggering Article 5, though. NATO has never before accepted a member in the midst of a conflict, and technically speaking, Russia is not attacking Ukraine so much as it's already attacked the nation. There might be room for the alliance here to justify that the ongoing war does not meet the requirements for an Article 5 resolution, and thus Ukraine joining wouldn't put Europe into war against Russia. But if Article 5 were to not be invoked, it runs the risk of fundamentally weakening the alliance. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization is built upon the principle that every member of the alliance will immediately respond to even the most insignificant of aggression against the other member. If this is compromised, it tests the integrity of the alliance and would be of serious concern of those NATO members who sit right on Russia's doorstep. Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia could all be swallowed up relatively fast by a Russian offensive, while mustering the forces to repel Russian troops would take some time and come at great expense. If the Baltic states question the integrity of Article 5, it might splinter the alliance in the future and achieve Putin's aims of dismantling the single obstacle to his plans of former Soviet glory. If Ukraine were to join NATO, it's likely the alliance wouldn't immediately declare war on Russia. Instead, it would provide arms, equipment, and supplies, and intelligence to Ukraine, albeit on a much larger scale. In fact, this is probably what President Zelensky is hoping for. Putting NATO into an official proxy war state against Russia would make a big difference to the amount of support he receives for the ongoing conflict. 
but this might be largely unnecessary as Ukraine already receives a great deal of support from the alliance. Its conscripts are already being shipped out of the country, where they can train in the West in peace and safety, receiving expert training from NATO's most seasoned troops. Before returning home to fight, they are being equipped with the latest in NATO personal gear, putting the individual Ukrainian soldier in a far better position than his Russian counterpart. Ukraine joining NATO in the midst of a conflict does achieve one thing, justifying a rapid escalation by Vladimir Putin. In fact, Ukraine joining NATO would be a massive propaganda win for Putin as it would justify his invasion. Back when the war started, Putin sold his invasion to the Russian people as necessary to take down a Nazi regime, headed by a Jew, and to keep NATO from expanding yet again onto the Russian border. A Ukrainian membership into NATO would only show that he was right. Well, only about the NATO thing, not the ridiculous Nazi thing. As he spent decades whipping the Russian people up into an anti-NATO frenzy, Putin could sell this event as a critical threat to the integrity of Russia itself, garnering the public support he desperately needs for a full-fledged mobilization of the nation. Already, NATO is the boogeyman in most Russian minds. They're to blame for everything that goes wrong in their lives. Poor economic performance? NATO is manipulating the global economy against Russia. Poor Russian military performance? NATO is secretly fighting alongside Ukrainians. Drop your toast butter side down onto the ground? NATO. But suppose that Ukraine joined NATO and the alliance agreed to invoke Article 5. What would happen then? Firstly, NATO air forces would begin an immediate and extensive air campaign against Russian forces inside Ukraine. In response to Russian threats to use tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine, American Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin had a private conversation with Russian Minister of Defense Sergei Shoigu. Though the details of the conversation remain classified, it's widely believed that Austin warned Shoigu that the United States, along with NATO allies, would respond to a Russian nuclear attack with overwhelming air power attacks against Russian positions inside Ukraine. This should be enough to send a shiver down the spine of any Minister of Defense, as NATO air power is extremely formidable. Back in Desert Storm, NATO's air campaign handily dismantled one of the best air defense networks in the world and then laid waste to Iraq's logistics, communications, and supply networks. When the ground offensive started, NATO warplanes brought some of the worst destruction to a country since the Second World War. What should worry Russia the most is that Iraq's air defenses were modeled on Soviet defenses, and Russia has not changed the doctrine very much since then. A NATO air campaign would first focus on eliminating Russia's ability to threaten the airspace inside Ukraine. Air and missile attacks would target air defense radars and installations along the Russian border, while the Black Sea is swept clear of the Russian Black Sea fleet. As evidenced in Ukraine, American HARM, high-speed anti-radiation missiles, are extremely adept at destroying air defense radars. Russia's only protection would be to keep NATO air forces at bay with its own fighters, an extremely dubious proposition given that American air-to-air -air missiles have greater range than their Russian counterparts, its planes have better radars, and the spearhead of the attack would almost certainly be stealthy F-35s and F-22s anyway. This leaves Russia with only one other option, using its S-300 and S-400 air defense units, but these require their radars to be turned on, which makes them a prime target for wild weasel attacks using harm missiles. The only thing slowing down the air campaign would be that Russia has initial numerical superiority given that the fighting is taking place on its own doorstep, and it would take time for NATO planes to move to airfields near the action and for logistics networks to be set up. However, the Russian Air Force has been conspicuously absent from the fighting in northeastern Ukraine, a massive red flag that warns something might be fundamentally wrong with the state of Russia's aerospace forces. If Russia can't project air power right across its own border, there's certainly no hope it can protect itself from a concentrated NATO air campaign. Once Russia's ability to threaten Ukraine's airspace is dealt with, a massive bombing campaign would begin against any Russian forces that have not surrendered or retreated yet. Already, the United States has positioned B-52 bombers in England for just such a possibility. The difference between NATO bombing campaigns and Russian ones, though, is that NATO uses almost exclusively smart weapons, giving them lethal precision. With nothing but short-range air defenses available to them, Russian ground forces would be decimated by an overwhelming air campaign and inevitably forced to retreat. The use of NATO air power alone would likely be enough to secure victory in Ukraine, with no need to commit ground forces other than the Ukrainian military already present. Russia has proven itself to be an ineffective, corrupt, and incompetent fighting force marred by corruption that has hollowed it out from within. But this might actually make Russia more dangerous. As it always does, the use of NATO forces inside Ukraine inevitably runs into one single conclusion. Russia must use nuclear weapons if it hopes to avert a catastrophic defeat. Unless Vladimir Putin is willing to admit that he was wrong 
and allow himself to become a pariah to be reviled in Russian history for centuries to come, his only recourse for stopping a NATO offensive would be to use nuclear weapons. He has already set the stage for their use by annexing Ukrainian territories. Now under the guise of defending sovereign Russian territory, Putin has given himself the excuse to use nuclear weapons. Where the conflict goes from there is anyone's guess. But what's sure is that NATO's commitment to the war would only increase, not decrease. If this means more conventional military force or even nuclear, biological, or chemical attacks, however, is anyone's guess. And this is why ultimately many agree that the question of Ukraine's NATO membership needs to be deferred until after the war is over. Ukraine already enjoys many of the benefits of the alliance, especially as it proves it can fight and win against superior Russian forces. Now is the time for NATO to defeat Russia by simply giving Ukraine the tools it needs to do so on its own. And this means heavy and modern equipment such as the Leopard tanks and F-15 Fighting Eagles, not more Cold War hand-me-downs. Now go check out what will Ukraine do after the war with Russia, or click this other video instead.